Amanda Butzkis is a professor of contemporary art history and theory at the University of Guelph. Her research focuses on the intersection of ethics and art as these things relate to ecology. I reached out to her because I've been trying to understand the problem of plastics for a long time. If you remember, I spoke to Heather Davis, Mark Simpson, and Sarah King back in February about this intimidatingly large problem. I'd been reading Amanda's book, Plastic Capitalism, and really couldn't stop thinking about some of the challenges that it makes. We talk a lot about the ideas in that book, but also unpack some of the more recent writing she's done. Incidentally, I'm excited about the project that she's currently working on, which focuses on the different ways that we can visualize environments, and especially the environments of the circumpolar north. One of the most important observations Amanda makes, I think, in this conversation is that when art reveals something, it's not necessarily revealing something that's hidden. Often what art does, she says, is drag us deeper into the mud. So instead of illuminating some obscured part of social reality or offering up epiphanies about society and our relationship to wild nature, art that engages with waste communicates that we are awash in waste but don't know what to do with it. We have tons of plastic, but not much plasticity. We're bent on accumulating energy, but don't really value energy expenditure in any radical way. Most of it is mindless. If we don't get to the bottom of why this is such a feature of the modern human condition, we aren't likely to address the climate emergency. We're more likely to just replace fossil fuels with some other energy input like solar and change nothing about our arrogant attitude towards the fuels we extract for energy. There's a lot in this conversation on the need to be more conscious and critical about energy consumption. After all, it is dangerous to be anything else. But what Butskis is asking is whether we are in denial, too, about the irrevocable damage we've already done to the biosphere. Art, ecology, and ethics form a big knot, as she puts it, and what's implicated is nothing short of how we choose to live on the earth. She leaves us with the idea that while art must be political, science is undermined if it's too political. And yet, the examples she explores in her work question that assumption, or the opposition between art and science in ways that help us rethink the distinctions that determine funding and influence our means of knowing the world before, during, and after oil. I really appreciate this opportunity to kind of unpack the ideas in your work, which I see, um, you know, all these points of connection, obviously with, with other people who are writing about ecology and energy and art and, um, and feels like everything. Um, but because it kind of feels like everything in part, I wanted to start by talking about what feels like a kind of, you know, signature style that you have, or at least the, the kind of particular uh, almost timbre of your writing um, and, and how you've developed kind of the way that you theorize subjects through your writing. Um, you know, and, and I've been thinking a lot about this in relationship to the sort of invitation that Max Liberon gives the reader uh, in their book, Pollution is Colonialism. They invite us to read non-extractively. Um, and I found myself having to read your work in a similar way without kind of surveying for facts or concepts that can be easily extracted and used, you know, expended. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's the interdisciplinary quality of it. Um, or the often very theoretical quality, or the fact that you are talking about art, uh, but something about your writing felt not like not slippery, but kind of resistant to that utilitarian thing of extraction for our own ends. Um, so I wondered if this was a conscious goal, if you set out to produce a theorization of art that isn't easily installed into a larger tradition. You know, basically, I'm wondering about your writing process, whether your your thinking is worked out in the writing and who maybe your main influences are. Wow, that's a really generous um, uh, reflection and provocation, and I appreciate it so much. Um, 
Yes. Okay. To read non-extractively and, um, and I guess in a sense I'm writing non-extractively or, or I'm, uh, writing, uh, to refuse extractivism that, that would be, yeah, I, I would like to think of my writing that way. And I would like to think of my thinking that way. Um, so the writing comes from thinking and I, I'm going to start by suggesting that it comes from thinking about art in the first place, that that uh, maybe ethic of thinking um, is proposed by art that is resistant to its own extraction. I mean, in some ways, I think of that as the legacy of conceptual art, um, that it, you know, that art started, especially in the post-war era, to um, to sort of present itself in ways uh, that were antithetical to the commodity and Mm -hmm. sometimes to the point of being completely immaterial or simply a gesture or, you know, a kind of reconfiguration of the environment. Um, And so there's a way that even just to give an account of art like that um, is to refuse to extract from it. It doesn't want to be extracted from Um, but then I think there is also something about, um, you know, that comes from the ecological predicament. I I like how you started this, uh, reflection by saying, you know, there's almost a a kind of theory of everything going on you know, Mm -hmm. there, there are several theorists sort of thinking about, um, energy humanities, uh, ecology, relationality, um, coloniality and and sort of all of these bound up in a big knot. But the question is, okay, what differentiates the thinkers and what are they proposing? You know, in a sense, you have to give an account of all of that knottedness. But then there are other things going on there. For me, um, I think even, you know, since I started uh, thinking about waste and, I mean, I've been writing about... Um, ecology and ethics, you know, my entire career, but it, it changes as more, more and more people sort of get involved with it. And I think, um, it has become inadequate for me to simply even interpret art. So I can't just sit there and say, okay, uh, the, the ethic, the ecological ethic comes from art itself, because then all that would be going on is that you're a kind of passive interpreter of art or somebody Mm -hmm. that sort of puts language to experience. But there's more to theorization and argumentation than that too. And Mm -hmm. so I would say the the fine line that I would like to think I draw is between that experience, experiencing art, experiencing ecological entanglement, um, even, even the new forms of visibility and perceptibility that are presented in and through art and mm-hmm. probing it, interrogating it, um, <sighs> critiquing it. And I use the word critique a little bit, um, you know, a, a little bit hesitantly because critique is often, uh, presented in such a way that it would be cutting through or even dismissing or, you know, uh, uh, cutting it apart to the point where it can't exist anymore. And I, and I, and I think that's what I don't want to do. I don't want to do that with art. I don't want to do that with ecology, but nevertheless, all of the, you know, the, the predicament demands that we interrogate, that we question. And sometimes questioning takes a long time. Like I think of myself as very wordy. I think of myself as very, you know, like, uh, wanting to take all the twists and turns and sort of leave no stone unturned. Mm -hmm. Um, but even in turning over each one, it's not like I want to break them apart uh, to get mm-hmm. Heideggerian about it. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting, and and uh, for me is really helpful for understanding the kind of uh, motive force in your writing, uh, because yeah, like the there is an interest in uh, critique on some level, like some form of deconstruction, um, but then there's clearly a sort of self difference or ambivalence about doing that. Like you write that, quote, what art reveals is precisely the inefficacy of acts of revealing. 
um, and then elsewhere that it's easy to dismiss messages that function like a moral imperative. So there's like this refusal of the very sort of like um, the the imperative to reveal, to expose. But then there are points in the book where you describe works of art as kind of exposing this or that thing. So like there is this level of ambivalence, but nonetheless, like there, I think is like a through line of thinking about arts, as you put it, paradoxical usefulness and uselessness, versatility and homogeneity, ubiquity and particularity that makes art evasively concerned with the ways that we humans choose or don't choose to live on the earth. Um, And so I was like thinking about this in relation to something you said years ago now on the Cultures of Energy podcast, that plastic and waste art gives voice to eco-anxiety in a weird way uh, by offering a speculative position on the future of capitalist overproduction and like our place in it, maybe our vexed place in it. Um, So outside of acts of revealing the truth, I'm wondering what in this moment, the value of waste of expenditure might be for helping people engage with eco-anxiety and what you call global systemic failures. So I think when I am making statements about you know, the inefficacy of revealing. It's not that art isn't trying to reveal something. It's that revealing isn't revealing something that's so hidden. It's revealing Mm -hmm. something that's sort of hidden in plain sight. So it's not like um, it offers a kind of um, eureka moment. Like, Mm -hmm. so... I think what I was trying to um, to get to, and and what I think really is um, how art is working, is that art is is reconfiguring or or recapitulating um, the predicament that we're in, but it doesn't do so with a view to like we can get rid of it. Um, and so, in some ways, the paradigm of um, like the paradigm of energy that I was working with to give an account of waste um, is to say, okay, the, you know, we can uh, imagine ourselves wasting, but the waste isn't going anywhere. It's always coming back and you can show the waste that's coming back, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily change anything. It doesn't even necessarily demystify anything. In fact, it's more like, you know, because I think that in a certain kind of critical tradition, demystification actually is a kind of, oh, I, you know, I was under the spell of seeing Mm -hmm. the world through a certain lens, and now I see clearly. And art is sort of doing the opposite. It's like, you know, our lens is muddy. It's demystifying in the sense that it's like, your lens is muddy. Let's go deeper into the mud. And let's, you know, let's uh, not fantasize that we can uh, get rid of this problem or that, you know, get rid of ourselves or sort of push away. So in a sense, the, the idea that you can extract and refine a resource is one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is that, you know, there are byproducts and, and waste products that you can get rid of. And then you can always come, you know, you can always sort of isolate this, this pure core of something, some kind of energy, right? Um, and and then that can be used and it can be used to corroborate a certain kind of self-concept, even if that's not just the self-concept of the subject, but the self-concept of humanity itself. And so um, the thing that art does in a sense is, yes, it it will show, okay, that's, that is a fantasy, that's a, there's a mystique to it, um, but not in such a way that it it provides clear sight at all. Mm. If anything, it's quite the opposite. It's like, listen, we are something that we do not know. We like to be an ecological being is to be um, is to be quite tangled up in all these materials and relationalities in waste itself. I find that really um, interesting and and you know fertile ground to kind of, yeah, like figure out a means through which um, communication can happen in a more lateral kind of way, in a sense, 
I really like this idea that the the kind of knowingness of the subject is about corroborating a self concept. And I see like a lot of the examples that you're drawing from as deliberately sort of undermining that on on a, on a certain level. And that could be why uh, some of the examples that you you gesture to um, don't even register in some instances as art. Um, uh, I, I, I suppose, or at least um, for funding bodies. Like I wanted to talk about Mel Chin's revival field and just generally maybe get into some of the examples that you engage with. For context, uh, if I can quickly sort of summarize what you say in, in Plastic Capitalism, Mel Chin's uh, revival field enlisted Dr. Uh, Rufus Cheney, you say, uh, a scientist from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You know, Cheney was a, a, a kind of expert in what are called what's called phyto extraction um, and and research particular plants called accumulators that can absorb toxic metals but I guess this is like this is an unproven form of almost like geoengineering and Cheney I guess hypothesized that there were certain plants that could absorb a lot of heavy metals into their roots and leaves and could be um, even harvested for for ore and recycled for industrial use and so this is like again pretty fertile ground no pun intended and chin receives a grant from the national endowment for the arts um and then that offer i guess you say you kind of narrate how that offer was nearly uh rescinded um by the chairman of the nea uh, at the time who said it had no aesthetic merit and that it was quote categorically science as you put it not art Um, So I'm really interested in this and why you're kind of mining the intersections between science and art, Um, you know, and and I guess like how this for you kind of typifies these controversies surrounding art, art funding uh, and censorship. Um, I love this one quote, for example, where you say, as panel member John Epstein quipped, I sniff politics. So like there's a politics to like obviously the use of living non-synthetic life to solve the problem of something like heavy metals or plastics pollution. Like it's interesting, like these aren't seen as political or cultural interventions until um, someone sniffs politics. Otherwise it's just this sort of like, almost like this thing that we're meant to passively experience. I wondered if you cared to return to your thinking around Melchin's revival field um, in light of sort of new research or discoveries like these, um, you know, what what was so kind of provocative about that piece for you? Yeah. Uh, so revival field. I mean, it's interesting because um, I think that revival field was a very uh, quiet work of conceptual art and sort of a of you know, a formative artwork in the history of eco art, but quiet in the sense that that history is only just in the process of being written, or at least, you know, mm-hmm. when I started um, sort of researching, like in, in my PhD, um, you know, my, I had heard that Mel Chin was like, I haven't had my due as an artist. And actually just last year, he got a MacArthur Genius Award. So, you know, Hmm. his career has been long and, you know, he's uh, really wonderful about sort of navigating these terrains and these art science collaborations. But what I like about Revival Field is the fact that um, it, you know, what one of the outcomes, like there was the artwork itself, which was a restoration of a piece of landfill um, and mm. and a rest like but like a not just a cosmetic one, because restorations, they can have different, you know, there are different levels of approaching what a restoration is. It can be cosmetic and can be sort of like closing up a landfill and turning it into a park. Or it can be like what Mel Chin was trying to prove, which is that plants can like with the phyto accumulators, um, that they can uh, clear the soil of heavy metals. Um, mm-hmm. and, and detoxify it in a, in a profound way, in a geochemical way. Mm-hmm. And so that was a component of the artwork. But then it was also, you know, very targeted and very delimited. And it's like, here's the frame. And the frame of the artwork itself, like it, it's sort of shaped like um, a bullseye in a square. And, you know, and there are these different areas of, of uh, you know, where 
you know, it's this particular plant and then it's this particular plant. And then there were different phases of it as well. But in many ways, what was, I think, pivotal about it is that it was designed to, you know, to sort of be to undergo a peer review process, like by peer review scientists, so that they could mm -hmm. say, okay, you had this, you know, you had one, you, you designed the test in order to prove that this is a phenomenon. And that's the research that had been shut down during the, um, the first, uh, uh, during the first George Bush era, that is George Bush senior, um, and, and, a, and a real sort of cut to scientific research. What's interesting, I think, about what you're saying is there's a sense in which, and I, th I think we see this today, it's like science can be undermined if it seems too political, mm -hmm. um, whereas art requires a certain kind of politics in order to get its credibility. But then it, is it politics or is it critique? Like at a certain point, if you think of it in those terms, then what politics is starts to break down because politics should be expansive, right? It should mm -hmm. be expansive about knowledge. It shouldn't be like science is apolitical, art is almost hyperpolitical. That can't mm -hmm. be, you know, like that. that's just sort of, um, or like if we're in a scenario where that is the case, then politics itself sort of loses its underpinning. Um, and, and loses its definition. And then you get something like social critique instead, which is like not, you know, not too political, but nevertheless, you know, requires a certain kind of thought as though mm. thought can exist without politics. So, so I'm, I um, do not like that kind of situation or that kind of like separation of the endeavors of art and science. And so, yeah, I, I thank you for your mm. question, because to go back to Revival Field, um, it, it goes to show that what has staying power or even um, what makes that work more relevant than ever, more relevant than we knew at the time that it was designed, is that um, it puts pressure on that separation of the political. It definitely um, points to the fact that, you know, both art and science require research. They have to be vetted and, and the whole process has to be financed. And that financing belongs to certain kinds of what we, you know, what we generally think of as political bodies. Um, mm -hmm. But both art and science, especially in tandem, can put pressure on um, and give visibility to that movement of money towards knowledge. Hmm. I wanted to pick up on something else you were saying about sort of like to tease it out, I guess, like rejecting that separation of art and science, but then sort of realizing that the one of the main reasons you want to do that is to search out a kind of stickiness or, or staying power, um, something that doesn't just resonate, but sort of, you know, reverberates uh, over time. And I think like the stuff that you write about landfills, um, you know, speaks to that uh, for me, like the, this idea of like, landfills are, are relegated to the, the margins, they're, they're about rejecting um, you know, refuse, they're about disappearing disposability. Um, like, I think the pieces that you're talking about engage with that. Um, and so you, you write in Plastic Capitalism that, uh, quote, today landfills are politically engaged sites where waste is processed and returned to economic and cultural cir circulation. And you note that landfills are not the material end game that they signified at the, in the early 20th century. They're no longer places where all things return to the earth. Um, you know, the argument here is, I think, concerned with like how things thrown away find their way back into the economy. But I wondered if we could, you know, as hard as it is, uh, but I think as important as it is, think through the site of the landfill at a moment where in Winnipeg, Manitoba, the Prairie Green Landfill is bringing many oppositional forces together to demand that the city, the province, the federal government commit to locating the remains of two or possibly even three indigenous women who were murdered and then abandoned to this pit. So, you know, Camp Morgan, which has been at the Brady Road Landfill since December, um, originally erected a blockade to send a message to officials and didn't even 
like entirely block the landfill. And yet there's been this injunction to remove uh, folks there. So like there's this determination to keep this zone uh, of disappearance intact. Um, and the protesters are just going to regroup and, and refuse that disappearance. In terms of your writing about the ways that landfills don't securely remove waste from the world, um, I wondered if you could speak to how waste, the waste of time, of bodies, of money, all of which the city is citing as an excuse for not trying to locate the bodies, um, is a central consideration here. Landfills must be taken up as as places where we think about, um, you know, our attempts to commit the, you know, mat- materialities, um, entities, um, histories out of, you know, out of consciousness altogether, but that, but that mm-hmm. completely fails. And so it's very strategic to say, well, let's not look at the landfill. That's, you know, that's the landfill as though once something is in a landfill, it becomes meaningless when in fact, um, you know, my research and that of of many ecologists suggests that actually you know you could you can learn everything about you know about um you know social organization um by excavating a landfill mm-hmm. um but i think what is different um even just a little bit from what i was talking about versus what you're talking about is you know i was sort of um like in plastic capitalism, I was sort of suggesting that, you know, that what art is doing is, is um, ushering in a kind of archaeological or even archaeomodern perspective. Like, let's look at our modern ruins and because modernity has a particular uh, temporality to. Um, and so, it, you know, so you get a kind of uh, geological perspective by doing an excavation of a landfill. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the controversies that came out that is related, I think, is sort of this, you know, whether or not to commit the, the ruins of the world trade center to the fresh kills Mm -hmm. landfill. And Mm -hmm. there were so many objections because, you know, the idea of doubling, um, uh, a cemetery in which we commemorate people and honor them, um, and honor the dead, that that should double with a landfill was outrageous. Mm-hmm. Well, in the situation that you're talking about in Winnipeg, the landfill has been, um, you know, exactly an attempt to to um, to conceal um, missing and murdered Indigenous women. Mm-hmm. And so what what is demanded politically is, you know, exactly an excavation, an interrogation and and exactly that, you know, okay, what is this site? This site, which is a landfill, is now very charged um, with with meaning, Mm -hmm. um, with mourning, with, um, you know, with this historical consciousness that um, I do see that as um, really coming forward. You know, there's the case of the landfill, but then there's also, you know, um, these these unmarked burial sites all over Canada um, that were connected to the residential schools. So children that have been simply, you know, um, children who were buried um, and, uh, and with them all the, you know, all the abuses of the residential school system. So this is where um, it's, uh, you know, the landfill can be, yeah, in some ways, I, I think I'm hesitating so much because I don't want to suggest that what is primary here is a geological knowledge or even an archaeological right. knowledge. It's political knowledge, right? It's the politicization yeah. of landfills that is key. That's right. And, you know, there's there's more that could be said, of course. And and I encourage people to read uh, Plastic Capitalism for its consideration of you know the the landfill the story of the fresh kills landfill in particular is is really um remarkable like it's 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 you know i i had no idea um but it speaks to as well just like the the histories that are buried in a city um you know the the yeah like the there's 
there's so much more that we could say, but maybe um, we could sort of uh, switch gears in a sense and think through um, the problem of energy. Um, you know, that, that there's all this energetic input uh, that drives growth and, and that, uh, you know, leads to this kind of, uh, it feels like culture and cult of disposability um, is a major, it feels like a major concern in a lot of your writing. Um, and so, you know, I guess the like broad question is, you know, why energy? What brought you to the question of energy? Um, and, and, and kind of uh, coextensively the question of waste and maybe in art specifically. Um, I can give you a little bit more specific um, sure. uh, orientation if you like. Um, you know, like I think uh, f- for for a lot of folks in what now gets called the energy humanities, this it feels like offshoot of environmental humanities. It is about naming extraction, but maybe more particularly extractivism um, as a primary like antagonist. Uh, you know, Jennifer Wenzel and Imre Zeman have this essay in textual practice called What Do We Talk About When We Talk About Extractivism? At the end of that essay, they talk about Stuart Hall's prescription that we, quote, keep alive the pressure of the irrelevance many of us feel about the capacity of our work to have a political impact, even and especially in disciplinary formations like cultural studies or environmental and energy humanities. Um, so, there is this like tension in the energy humanities, um, like a political ambition to end extractivism and extraction. You know, so you've written that uh, scholarship in the energy humanities suggests that the economy does not simply extract energy from life, but that the form of extraction and use of energy give rise to cultural forms. I find that really helpful. Uh, but I wanted to kind of bring it into conversation with a more recent piece that you wrote for uh, the for- forthcoming book, Celerities, Elemental Encounters and Refractions. Um, so in this essay, Tupilac, In the Shadow of Celerity, um, you know, I, I thought that sort of um, the energy humanities for you is is something that like is kept alive against the pressure of that irrelevance by remembering that like we aren't always necessarily ho- beholden to like green capitalism when we're writing, like we can talk about the sun and not talk about photovoltaics, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so I, w- I wondered if you wanted to comment on the, the specific goals of this essay, some of its concern, but also like this idea that the energy humanities, if it is a discipline, um, should maybe accommodate reflections on celerity, the sun, that are not just fixated on like energy transition specifically. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's several levels to this, um, to your provocation here. So, so I, I, I've been thinking as you're, as you're talking, okay, what seems to be, there seems to be a bottom line vis-a-vis extraction with the energy humanities. Mm-hmm. And I think as, you know, when I was writing Plastic Capitalism, um, you know, very much under the sway of Georges Bataille, who's thinking about energy in terms of um, accumulation and accumulation mm-hmm. as being, you know, the fundamental um, drive of capitalism and especially bourgeois capitalism. So it's never, so it's not just, you know, when I was talking about sort of these, uh, these fantasies of extraction a little bit earlier that, you know, you could sort of isolate something and refine it and get rid of anything that's, you know, anything, any waste that's sticking to it. So Mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's one way of thinking about extraction, but not necessarily, that's not necessarily an accumulation. That's more like mm-hmm. a power, right? Like, how can I refine right. something? And I do think that that's part of extraction and a, an important part of uh, thinking energy humanities. Like, what is the the seat of being itself, philosophical being? Um, what is it that's being discovered by science? You know, like there is a kind of mythic energy that um, that we quest after when we are extracting, but that I think could be thought 
by itself. And I think the sun is, you know, the sun is for Bataille, the sun is that mythic entity or, you know, and solarity would be um, that power that is bestowed to us humans by the sun. And yet it's extremely ambivalent. Like Bataille's point is you can never accumulate that power. You can never Mm -hmm. accumulate solarity. Well, you can, you can for a short time, but you will, um, it destines you to expenditure. You'll have to let go of that energy and and to the point of your own death. So there's a kind of death drivenness to that energy. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I think that for me with classic capitalism, it's like, okay, yes, if you think about waste in relation to accumulation and you realize that in fact, we're accumulating waste, we're not expending it. And that waste, you know, that, that you can see that accumulation, not so much in terms of our garbage, that's sort of one, maybe tip of the iceberg, but definitely in terms of carbon emissions and climate change, these other kinds of markers that are only just, you know, they're starting to be thought in the last half century or something like that. And I mean, Mm -hmm. other people trace uh, climate change measures uh, even further back into the 19th century. You know, I think for me, there's extraction per se. So this fundamental thing of accumulation. But what art offers, I would say, is or what it tries to open up is the possibility of energy exchange without accumulation or without accumulation being this foregone conclusion. So can we still, even like in a social sense, it's like, can we relate and can we, um, can we offer to one another? Can we even use one another without it being um, driven towards that accumulation? And can we look at one another without wanting to extract with a view to accumulation? So is that possible? And, um, you know, yes, socially, as far as art is concerned, absolutely. Does that check out in terms of the technicalities of energy exchange? Um, I think it depends on what your your energy object is. And so I was thinking about that when I was writing the piece um, about Tupilac, which Mm -hmm. is you know, okay, now that we're, you know, this is, this is, um, you know, a volume on solarity, elemental solarities. Now you have the energy humanists thinking in particular about, about these implications that come from Bataille, but other thinkers too. How should we think about solarity? And I think, you know, in many ways the, you know, the entire endeavor is motivated by this idea that solar energy and solar energy tech can um, gradually replace fossil fuels um, Mm -hmm. or at least uh, temper them so that we'd be drawing from an energy mix or something like that. Mm -hmm. To me, there are many dangers in, in sort of putting solarity, like slotting solarity into that understanding of energy at all. And, you know, I think of, um, so my case study was thinking about the, you know, the cultural practices of the Arctic Inuit um, from uh, in Nunavut and also in Greenland and um, and also Alaska it sort of starts by thinking about okay there is this historical organization of peoples known as the Thule and they are the ancestors of the Inuit um, and the Thule you know the Thule were studied or have been studied archaeologically with a view both to um, you know by by the Canadian government. Uh, the you know the study of Thule remains was used as a rationale to displace the Inuit way further north than they had um, than they had settled so, um, in the twentieth century. So there's this and and so the in a sense I'm like okay here's the you know they study the remains and they study how long those remains have been there and there are these effects of the sun. So that's mm-hmm. one way to think you know the sun is what illuminates. Um, uh, illuminates objects and materials and peoples and history. Yeah, you could think of it that way, but that's very that's very much the the myth of scientific illumination. 
And I'm saying, okay, but the medium is the message. You know, you're going to mm-hmm. come to certain kinds of conclusions and knowledge forms and organizations of people based on that myth of illumination and that myth that, you know, you can, you can chart the evolution of a people, but you're not actually getting at you know, what makes, you know, what makes that particular organization, like who were the Thule? Who -hmm. were the Thule? Um, And so, you know, but we should, we should think about sort of contemporary practices of the Inuit and, um, and their understanding of the sun, you know, so, so Mm -hmm. I was, thinking about it like partly tupelac which is like a little object and you might find tupelac they were they were sort of carved um out of bone and and sold to tourists and have been you know f- since uh the 18th century and you can still buy them but mm-hmm. the idea with the tupelac is that you know that at first the the idea of the tupelac c- came from storytelling and this idea that you could sort of cobble together out of different materials um, an object and charge it with uh, mm-hmm. a curse, and um, and that you that that object could then you know like you could wish ill on someone and and you would um, charge it up and then throw it into the sea and then it would go after you know it would turn into a kind of being and it would go and attack the person that you were trying to curse. But there's always the hitch that if that person was stronger than you who are casting the spell, the Tupelac would come after you. They could turn mm-hmm. the Tupelac around. Mm-hmm. So the Tupelac is a story about Inuit social organization. And in, in a sense, it's about the recoil of your own output, and mm-hmm. um, which, which I find fascinating. But part of the way that the Tupelac charges is, is moonlight. Um, under the moon. And so I sort of suggest at the end, well, Tupelac, you know, it's, it's a powerful story, but it could as much be charged by the sun as by the moon. Like, let's be careful about the energies that we bring to, to our materials. You might be illuminating um, the Thule remains, but you might be activating something else too, is, is the suggestion. But importantly, Tupilac is a story of exchange. It's an ex- it's an exchange that happened over you know over many decades. You know, like it was those objects came about because the Inuit were like, oh, the you know the settlers love our stories about the Tupilac, so they would embellish them and they would make mm-hmm. these figures. You know, they would disfigure them because it would produce more of a chill, and so they sort of pandered to that to that desire. Um, and so it's it's important to think about, you know, like that exchange is is an exchange of storytelling. It's an exchange of knowledge. It's almost like the anti-accumulator, right? Like the Tupelac is the anti-accumulator. Right. <laughs> it's a kind yeah. of it's a it's a kind of counter hegemonic storytelling. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to want to steal our culture. Here's you know, here's this disfiguration that we're going to offer you and you're going to enjoy it. You'll learn from it, but you can't have it. I mean, this is the thing. This is the way that you think through it. Like, I love that you use the term charged. It is charged um, with this kind of power, with this intention, but also uh, clearly with all of this meaning and, and maybe these histories. Like, I just really appreciate that, that generous account of a very densely packed, very rich piece um, that, um, you know, I it made a really deep impression on me. Like there are there are some very very kind of clear ideas about sort of the way that history is rewritten from a colonial perspective, but then there are these sorts of more um, you know um, these these deeper challenges around like our relationship to energy um, that are about like using the object to, to explain how the story is contained. Um, I like yeah the the use of McLuhan's medium is the message. Like it's it's really about materials matter. Um, you know, and, and the materiality of, um, what we consider to matter. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this is partly why uh, this might serve as a useful segue into thinking about like plastics as this, um, pliable, endlessly, um, you know, playful, but also deeply poisonous material that seems to, I think you suggest like define the Anthropocene as it's called in many ways, or the Capitalocene you zoom in on particular um, artworks that try to give us a means of 
uh, wrestling with plastics. Uh, the first one I wanted to mention was um, Portia Munson's Pink Project, uh, this 1994 work in the feminist exhibition Bad Girls at the New Museum in New York. Um, you know, you you explain that Munson gathered over 2,000 pink plastic objects into an installation that summarizes a hyperbolic femininity produced and mediated through the dissemination of products uh, like baby pacifiers, dolls, hair accessories, mirrors, fake nails, tampons, dildos, and cleaning products. Um, you know, this is about the 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 specific pliability of pink as a symbol of hyper femininity, and it made me, you know, inevitably think about Greta Gerwig's Barbie, which is the sort of, <laughs> you know, zeitgeist movie of the moment um, coming up on a billion dollars at the box office. Um, the thing, you know, this is a thing that many people are like making into, into memes. It has this pliability, uh, but they're also, you know, like actively reflecting on this movie, uh, you know, and, and I think like what's going on is that you have people like I think about people attending Portia Munson's like Pink Project, there are people that are reading that as like a critique of contemporary lean-in feminism, this sort of artificial feminism. Um, there, but there may be not a lot of people reading it for comments on like the wastes of consumer culture. But you know, like in the Barbie movie, when Margot Robbie is told to get into a box to reset her sense of self and experience. Mm-hmm. She experiences like a kind of comfort in that moment. It like provoked laughs in the theater, but there's also something about that act of like replasticizing uh, what we as the viewers see as an organic being that like feels appropriate somehow. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, like, have you seen the film? Do you have a reading of the way that it represents life in plastic as a perfect but really fragile and somehow yet also like durable state of being and maybe what it said about femininity from the perspective of plastic. Oh, yes. I, I, um, I have seen it Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I was thinking about it. Yeah. It's as though, um, pink and plastic are of the same, like they, they co-corroborate one another as topologies, right? right? And also as, you know, there is a sense in which plastic became um, uh, a feminized material, even though it's like, it's ubiquitous and, and we, you know, it's, it's not to say that Um, it's otherwise, or that, you know, the, the sort of male domain, if we were to go very binary, isn't plasticized, but there's a way that, um, I think the economically, um, plastics were pitched towards women as a way to give them freedom from certain kinds of labor. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and to make life easier, like even just plastic bags for groceries or something like that, like the, like the basics, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was, yeah, so what you're saying, that particular scene in Barbie where it's like get in your place and, and you know, mm-hmm. in your plastic box, <laughs> I was like, no, you know, like everybody, you know, no, <laughs> don't get in the box. <laughs> yeah. But plastic is our box. And, and in fact, plastic is the, um, is the container in the condition, I guess, of femininity as pink is, as Barbie mm-hmm. is. Well, I think there are two things. One, the the thought that I had after the movie was, ironically, um, Ken it steals the show, right? That's like right. a very well thought, well written character, and so it's important to not think about, you know, and and the movie is about their relationality or their irrelationality, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and it's sort of what makes the movie funny. Um, is there, you know, is there, is Ken, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, do we, you know, there was like an intention, like the, the, the movie wants to articulate, okay, well, I wanted, you know, even the maker of Barbie, spoiler alert, is like, well, <laughs> I made this for my daughter, I wanted, and it's as though a generation is saying to the younger generation of, of women, and it, let's let's not forget this is a very this is very much about gender binaries and affirming gender binaries, um, but it is about one generation of women saying to another, "We wanted you to be anything you, you know, you could be. We wanted mm. you to have anything and be able to be anyone." 
And so there's a, a myth of freedom that is very much of the episteme of plastic at stake. Um, and it's, and it's very clearly articulated, but it's sort of like, yeah, well, isn't that a good intention? Isn't it, isn't it good that, um, that young girls can become anything and that we should have dolls that show them how they can be, you know, doctors and lawyers and working people and, and still, you know, that's a great, yeah, that's a great take. <laughs> but I even feel like my own, um, I don't want to dismiss, I mean, this is where I would get into a certain language. Like mm -hmm. I want plasticity, but plastic is like the bad version of this. Why to want plasticity? Because it is, or it, in philosophy, there is this, you know, there is this relationship to, you know, like Catherine Malibu articulates mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. um, she's like, for Hegel, plasticity is this capacity to anticipate and also materialize into the future. And so it seems to me that, you know, there's um, plasticity is something that could be claimed by us, um, mm -hmm. by all of us. And, and, I, and I think I would want to say that in the most generous way, like not just for women, not just for women to claim the future, the freedom of the future, um, but for, for all of us to think of ourselves quite differently. Um, and that that's what plasticity, real philosophical plasticity entails. So if there's some mm -hmm. way to like, can I take some, leave some vis-a-vis uh, -vis plasticity? It's like, let's, can we, you know, can we think about, can we um, still want, is it okay to still want plasticity without it just sort of descending into the docile subject, whether Ken or Barbie, right? Hmm. Yeah, I uh, really, I love the, obviously the take on the film, but more broadly like this uh, gesture to Catherine Malibu's work, which, you know, in her uh, book on um, neuroplasticity, she sort of repeatedly asks or makes the statement in the introduction, you know, we make our own brains, but we don't know that we do. Um, and she means it like biologically, like physically, we are, we are fashioning our own um, brains, but also in this almost like uh, on a spiritual level, like talking about the interaction with like learning music as something that shapes us in um, fundamental and indeterminate ways. Um, but as you say, like plastic is the bad version um, because it, um, you know, sort of falsely advertises this, this open-endedness or freedom. Uh, while foreclosing that future in a, in a number of ways, I think. And like, so the, the other film that I uh, thought about uh, a great deal when, when thinking about plastics and these representations of plastics is um, David Cronenberg's visceral crimes of the future. Um, you know, there's a, there's a line from Roland Barthes uh, that you quote uh, that got me thinking about this film Um you know, which didn't seem to make that big of a pop cultural impression. Um, it's certainly not as fun as Barbie. It's very dour, <laughs> um, but it made an impression on me. And the line from Bartz is uh, the whole world can be plasticized, even life itself. Um, so there's a, there's a climactic scene in Cronenberg's film where the character Caprice declares that the crudeness and the desperation and the ugliness of the world has seeped inside even our youngest and most beautiful and we see that the world is killing our children from the inside out because their organs are, are suffused with plastic. Every day, we do continue to, to choose a synthetic economy that fills our bodies with plastics and plasticizers. Um, you know, this, this film, Crimes of the Future, centers on the birth of a child that is able to digest plastics and achieve this, as they put it, harmony with the techno world we've created. Um, you know, it, it feels like this prophecy or a self-fulfilling prophecy that like, if we don't reject, um, this culture of convenience, we're, we're going to end up like this. So if plastic waste is, as you say, a fundamental attribute of convenience anticipated and tailored by its chemical makeup, economic deployment, and the cultural meanings it procures in and through its aesthetic form, can we look to like a deeply disturbing film like Cronenberg's as almost like an affective way of feeling our way through the jarring effects of that convenience. Like 
the fact that we are accepting on some level that our bodies will be full of this this stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of repitch the question. This is a question mm-hmm. about is um, thinking itself a form of digestion or biodegradation. And I, I come to a, a statement like that because it's it strikes me that okay I haven't seen the Cronenberg now I now I have to, but if the idea is we could have you know we could, sir, however in some you know in some kind of scientific utopia dystopia, um, calibrate our our bodies to uh, process uh, mm-hmm. to digest plastics. Like, is that such a bad thing? Is that a good thing? Is that is yeah. that our plasticity itself in action? This is where Cronenberg's coming from. Like, he, this is what he says in interviews, is that it is like almost a hopeful film for him, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around. But anyway, sorry. Well, I don't think, like in some <laughs> right. ways, how is his hope different from the hope that I would see in something like Mel Chin's Revival Field, which is about, you know, creating this sort of you know area like seeing that happening in plants and mm-hmm. and what if everybody could grow um hyper accumulators in their gardens and and clear their soil of heavy metals there wouldn't mm-hmm. be poisons and you know like does it is it such a difference if it's my garden if it's my landfill if it's my own digestive system if it's you know these mushrooms that they've developed in Japan that can digest plastics well you know that's that I would say is techno utopian. We mm-hmm. hope so, um, but at the same time, I think there's a little bit of. Um, sometimes I think that uh, chemistry and the chemistry of plastics is like way, way it, like the effects of certain kinds of chemical manipulation are sort of way beyond our capacity to think them. So the, our best effort is sort of. Um, you know, the, the geochemistry of plants and possibly Mm. even, you know, there's so much, uh, research now about like, um, the thoughtfulness of the gut, gut health, and, you know, the relationship between your gut and your brain and your hormones and all of this sort of thing. This is very much Mm -hmm. the kind of paradigm of the body right now. Um, for those, you know, with the privilege to listen to those kinds of podcasts. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but there is a sense in which like, like almost like a refusal to accept that we could have done some kind of permanent and irrevocable damage to the biosphere. Are we at the horizon of a new paradigm? Or are we just in denial about damage done are we just in denial about things like climate change extinction um Mm. and the effects of the fossil fuel economy there is a way that i i think you know this is where sort of my argument that plastic is an economic expression an economic agent um it's to say that you know chemistry itself became this you know became this economic schema And, you know, so, so that economy and um, chemistry were just, were sort of working through one another, not as disparate domains of expertise, but as a common domain of expertise that could actually take command over every living thing and, and, and how it works and how it expresses. So, it would be wonderful. But then, you know, there's so much research to suggest that plastics um, change DNA and they, you know, like they, and they, and, and that what toxicity is, isn't just a kind of sticky, obtrusive, indigestible material, but that something like it actually is tinkering at the, at the genetic level of all life. That's where I would say, okay, yeah, I see how Cronenberg is like, yes, this is very optimistic. I would like to think of my body this way. And and maybe it's possible through genetics, right? Like this would be mm-hmm. um, genetic synthesis. It seems to me that he's thinking about the synthetic as the, you know, there's maybe a paradox there or he's splitting a hair. There's a difference between the plastic and the synthetic. 
For a long time, I think these two were synonymous. When somebody said plastic, oh, that looks plastic, it would be a kind of, it, it might be literal about the material, but it might be just a descriptor to say that's artificial. Um, but there's perhaps a reclaiming of the artificial, an embrace of the artificial, an embrace of the synthetic to say, okay, but we have always been synthetic. Um, mm. And in fact, the only way to defeat plastic is to be ever more synthetic. Mm hmm to become the sort of plastic conglomerate subject or something. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and this is the, this is the thing that certainly, um, you know, I get out of reading your work and Max Liboron's work, uh, you know, Heather Davis's beautiful book, Plastic Matter is this idea that um, to quote you again, plastic produces specific relations as it interpenetrates global forms, such as the economy, the earth's material substrate and the cultural meanings of waste. Um, at the end of chapter two of Plastic Capitalism, you say the interpenetration of waste in the human body is a kind of, you know, point of departure for taking hold of the ecological condition. You know, that also should, you know, lead people to read like Alexis Shotwell's Against Purity, which is about like the porousness of our bodies. It's this idea that, um, as Max Liberon says in Pollution is Colonialism, you can't clean up plastics. They exist in geological time. Um, and, and Liberon says it just, it, cleaning just shuffles them in space as they endure in time. You know, that interminability is key to plastics, especially because the standard relationality that plastic reinforces is one of disposability and forgetting, um, which is, I think, partly why it's so striking um, the, the, the way that you engage with um, uh, the, the albatross corpse photos by um, Chris Jordan. Um, which is about, you know, it, it, these are not hopeful images. These are, you you said on, on the Cultures of en Energy podcast, like masochistic or sadistic or, or sadomasochistic images. Like this is, um, this is a body open displaying undigested plastic and a corporeal reminder that plastic is never absented in the environment. Um, so your, you know, your reading of Jordan's photos, your acknowledgement of how sadistic they are. It all, I think, links up with Liberon's discussion of fish, fishes that are full of plastic um, in their book um, and, and the sort of sympathetic relation that Liberon expresses in that book. But the thing for me is this, you know, you, you don't exactly convey your own relation to the albatross in the book. Like that is, for me, not something that we glean or extract from it. Um, so when you ask about how, you know, how we are being asked to see, when you talk about bearing the suffering of the albatross, you don't talk about how you are being made to bear it, right? The first person pronoun isn't really a part of it. And so I just wondered about that stylistic choice and, and but what it, what it says about um, the almost spiritual or theoretical choice to not foreground your own relation to the non-human world. Um, which is something Liberon says that too many settler academics do in their writing on ecology, foreground their own relationality with regard to the non-human world. Why were you hesitant to center your own personal perspectives or feelings in the book here and elsewhere? I don't think I was hesitant. I think it's just, um, it, mm. in some ways, it's a disciplinary choice. Like sure. there are some technicalities to that distinguish writing about art from writing about uh ecology and i and i i think about them often um me, yeah. but you know from my perspective i'm not relating to the albatross i'm relating to a photograph as a viewer mm. and also i'm making claims to how the image is pitched to a viewer and mm. i so i do have points where i'll say um and this is more sort of, you know, I, I wrote a, I wrote a piece about the culling of mink um, after, you know, after the pandemic and, you know, and, and other kinds of, uh, you know, I've written about Sue Coe's work in, in factory farms. And I sometimes will stop and say, this is hard to see. This is hard mm -hmm. to read, even about reading Bataille's work. Um, and that's more because when I'm writing, um, I don't, want to it's it's not just about 
I don't want to express what I feel, or I don't want to mm -hmm. disclose my relationality, my, my engagement in the ecological predicament. I don't want mm -hmm. to yeah. preface, like it would be a chain of relationality from, you know, from this, from the albatross to the artist, to the image, to uh, me that's interpreting to the reader as well. And I don't want to assume that my perspective is going to necessarily, um, I don't I, like, I don't want to prevent the reader from having their own thoughts. Like I don't want to yeah, interfere. Yeah. And I actually think that that can be a bit the tendency with those who do want to surface too much um, mm -hmm. of their own, uh, of their own, maybe their own affects. So there's, you know, in art history, it has often been a, you know, like it was a sort of thing for, I don't know, I, I don't think it's so much a thing anymore, but to sort of get into a thick phenomenological description of an artwork as the opener and as the sort of opening gambit of, of the argument. Right. Well, that, even that thick phenomenological description is one which can um, it can conceal the the writer as much as it can reveal something about them, and because I've you know I, I've sort of I started with um, you know being really um, influenced and inspired by uh, by French phenomenologists or continental phenomenologists, um, I'm pretty aware of that, but I also sort of. I'm aware that I write in such a way as to let that phenomenology, let that theorization carry my feelings. So it's more like I'm schematizing myself towards, you know, towards theorization rather mm -hmm. than um, leaving myself. So sometimes I think it's a bit disingenuous. It's like when I have to talk about my, you know, like as though one is supposed to talk about one's feelings as distinct from one's theorizations. Well, no way. Mm -hmm. It's more like my theorizations get like I, you know, my theorizations, I feel get very charged and, and no more so than in recent years as I've been um, writing about animal extinctions. And I would say though, um, that I'm pretty aware of, you know, things like uh, phenomena, like bodily trauma, mm -hmm. emotional shock. These are part of the ecological condition. And to me, mm -hmm. I'm not going to, um, you know, shock and trauma tend to almost register is quite different. Like they may or may not register in the written word or they may register as flat. I write a lot mm -hmm. about flatness, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. there's, there's a sense in which it's, it's going to be almost factual that this is happening. So let's not assume that, um, let's not, you know, let's not limit the capacities of, um, of, theoretical expression that take place um in writing and let's not assume that they're all just sort of like um white central neutral universal like um one might be traumatized and it would be different you know it might be difficult to distinguish i would like to think that i'm carrying a lot of um you know a lot of statements of, of indignation condemnation um certainly shock and trauma but you know i'm not uh yeah i'm not sort of on my knees to the reader either mm -hmm. apologizing and and i think that um because i i think it would undermine um the endeavor the philosophical endeavor and the political endeavor so mm -hmm. um but but each of us is to navigate that territory i think i do my part yeah, I think so too. I mean, you know, there is um, all kinds of, of an, kind of animation. There is there is a kind of forcefulness when you say, for example, uh, we are living in a moment where radical expenditure is in fact prohibited. You know, like you're theorizing that point, but you're also condemning it. Like, you know, there's there's no need really for a personal account of uh, your specific, um, you know, investment in states of radical expenditure um you know you kind of leave that up to the reader and maybe this this is the 
not necessarily the best venue for uh, a kind of manifesto for radical expenditure. Um, but there is nonetheless this kind of uh, a vector here, you know, like a, a sense that like we, we ought to be attempting to bring that into being on some level. Um, and yeah, so I mean, the opportunity to think through some of these uh, texts that you're talking about, but also just to kind of like um, dwell on the difficulty of, of trying to think through these, you know, pretty irreducibly complex questions um, is, is, it's been great. So I, I appreciate you making the time for sure. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, Scott, the, um, your, your questions and um, the reflections that you brought forward have been really, um, well, really energizing for me to say the least. <laughs>